Hello, listeners. I hope everyone had a lovely holiday. And speaking of in the holiday spirit, I wanted to let you know about a few free resources on my website, pauseandreward.com. So there's always free show notes to talk about the lessons of each podcast. So you can go to my website and that's under the podcast tab. And then I have two free resources under the resources tab. The first is a connected walks course. So it's a free course where we go through several different modules in terms of how to keep your dog focused on you while walking. And then we also have a free enrichment ebook. So all of those are again, free. I hope that they're helpful and they're on my website, pauseandreward.com. I also want to just give a shout out to one of my listeners, Claire Jelly. They made a rating on Apple podcast, which is awesome. Thank you for my five-star rating. And they write, found you and your guests while desperately searching for resources that talked about the puppy blues, which I was in the throes of. And you have all given me so much patience and hope. In the following months, my pup and I have come so far and we say thank you. So I love connecting to my listeners. It is really the greatest reinforcer for me. I say it all the time, but really please feel free to send me a note on Instagram, pause and reward, uh, or Facebook, pause and reward. Um, shoot me an email, rate the podcast. Um, I, I just love hearing from all of you. And so thank you so much for your support of the show. So next I'm going to introduce my, uh, the guest that I had on this podcast, Dr. Patricia McConnell, as if she needs an introduction, but I am going to anyway. Uh, we had so much fun talking about developing resilience for our dogs, but also talking about it in the context of developing resilience for ourselves. Um, having dogs can be the most amazing journey you know, an amazing experience that we have access to, and it can also be really hard, right? And this podcast focuses on the human end of the leash as well as the canine. And so we got to talking about what are some um, ways that we could become more resilient as well. Um, so just to give you um, some background on Dr. Patricia McConnell, if you have not heard of her, um, she's a household name when it comes to behavior and training and has written so many books that most of us have lost count and she's made an innovative impact on our profession. So she is a zoologist and certified applied animal behaviorist emeritus has made, she's made a lifelong commitment to improving the relationship between people and animals. She is known worldwide as an expert on canine and feline behavior and dog training and for her engaging and knowledgeable dog training books, like I mentioned earlier. She also has DVDs and amazing in-person seminars. Patricia has seen clients for serious behavioral problems since 1988, and she taught the biology and philosophy of human-animal relationships for 25 years at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her radio show, Calling All Pets, was heard in over 110 cities, and she's an international speaker. So I was honored to get the opportunity to speak to her today. And here is our conversation. I hope you all enjoy. So today we're going to be talking about resilience in our dogs and ourselves. But before we get started on this particular topic, I want to bring back an oldie but a goodie question that I used to ask my guests. I know that you share your life with Maggie and Skip, and I wanted to ask you, what is your favorite thing about each of them? Oh, wow. What a great question. Um, do I have to pick one? Can I? <laughs> That's really hard. That is hard. So, oh, Maggie, 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 Maggie. So much about Maggie, but here's one. So here's one that, that strikes me right now is she has the most expressive face of, I think, any dog I've ever had. And her most extreme expression is one of joy. She has the, when she's happy, her face, it's like she swallowed the sun. I mean, it's just, mm. she just radiates joy. And she's just so beautiful. I cannot look at her without feeling happy. Um, oh, that's lovely. We ran at a sheepdog trial last May where, where there were sheep that, um, they were the kind of sheep that she loves that were really flighty. And after we were done, she literally was like, oh, 
that was the most fun I've ever had in my whole life. That was, oh, that was wonderful. Wasn't that wonderful? Oh, oh. I mean, she was just so, so when she's happy, she's over the moon happy. And that's, yeah, cool. I love that. And Skippy, oh, Skippy, Dippy, Skippy, 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 so many things. So I guess I'd have to start with, he is the most loving, sweetest, devoted kind of dog. I mean, he's a dog that a lot of people sort of fantasize. And sometimes I call him a golden retriever in a border collie suit. <laughs> he's just got that just sweetness, that incredible devotion. Um, right after I got him, I got him. He was three and a half when I got him. And right after I got him, uh, we were walking on leash and I slipped on a muddy trail. And he literally, I mean, I just had him like three days or something. He literally wheeled around and threw himself down beside me and lay down beside me. Oh, wow. I know. I know. I was like, oh, yeah, well, I'm keeping him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Definitely keeping that dog. Um, but, you know, but besides that, so I have to, I just have to pick two with him. But yeah, besides you can. that, Marissa, he is, um, with all that sweetness, he is a big, strong, powerful male. And he is committed committed to not losing the sheep. And just recently I was at a friend's sheep darted down a driveway at 20 miles an hour. I mean, they were just screaming and he had to go 25 miles an hour to get around to the front of them. Right. And they were mm -hmm. getting to a fence and he got halfway there and saw he wasn't going to make it. And he turned on his afterburners and made this commitment to like, I'm going to stop them or die trying. And, wow. and he, he's, he's specifically made that commitment. I call him, I call him the dog who's, who's attempted suicide by fence three times now. <laughs> he just has literally run into it anyway. So, so, I mean, after he did that, he could have been so aroused that he ended up, you know, opening his mouth and biting uh -huh. that happens, right? It does. Yeah. Nobody wants that to happen with sheep, but it does. Sometimes they're cursorial mm -hmm. predators. Right. And he was credibly aroused and he instantly calmed himself down. Wow. He, all this quiet power and finesse to bring the sheep back to me. It was, it was one of those like heart expanding moments, you know, it was really beautiful. So yeah. He sounds like yeah. an emotionally intelligent leader. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, that's a good way of saying it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, today is my dog's 13th birthday and we went on a hike this oh. morning and we were talking about I was like, let's just go through like 13 memories or 13 reasons why we love Sully and, and add one for good luck. And it just, I don't know. Just, well, I mean, I was, I was crying because my dog is 13 and, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. reflecting back on all of that. And it's just, yeah. I just love doing that just because we can get focused on the negative or the challenges really easily. And so it is lovely to, to start the podcast off with some, some goodness. So that's a wonderful thing to do. You know, that'd be a great thing to have a journal of just starting your day of what do I love about my dog? You know, the tiniest mm -hmm. little thing, you know, I love mm -hmm. the little piece of fur over their toenail, you know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. 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 I love yeah it was, it was interesting to see how mine were more memories or like, like the significance of Sully in my life. Whereas Scott, my partner's was more like his eyes or, yeah. or when he leans against my foot during the day, or right. I don't know. I just thought that that was yeah. really interesting what that we were looking for. Yeah. So, okay. So we'll, we'll move on to our topic of resilience. And so before we get started talking about this in the context I'm of I, have my tea, right? I can have my tea. Absolutely. Can we, can oh, have, everybody have some tea. Have, have your tea. <laughs> so we can define, um, what resilience means before we start talking about it in the context of like building resilience in our dogs and building resilience in ourselves when we're around our dogs. So can you tell our listeners what we mean by this concept of resilience? Yeah, absolutely. And my, the, the quickest, and I think almost, even though it's simple, most powerful example is a rubber band, a simple rubber band, you know, when it's new and fresh, you can pull it, right? And it mm -hmm. strains and it strains and it strains and then it snaps back. And as it gets older and older, it gets brittle and you pull and it snaps and it cannot get back to what it was before. Mm -hmm. And that is not a bad metaphor for resilience. You know, resilience is, is um, 
being able to cool yourself down after you get really hot, right? Um, I think a really good way actually to think of it is that kind of internal temperature paradigm where, you know, we, we, the chemistry experience that is us mm -hmm. <laughs> is, is um, experiment that is us is um, it only can work in a very, very small range of temperatures, right? And so, you know, if our temp goes up to 102, we're not well, we're very uncomfortable, we feel crummy, um, but, but something will happen where we recover and we get back to a normal temperature. Mm -hmm. If it goes to 104, 105, 106, things start breaking down and yeah. you just can't get back. And that's what a lack of resilience is. A lack of resilience is not being able to get back to normality, to get back to comfort zone, what, what um, physiologists call homeostasis, sort of the point where everything's working right and everything's balanced, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's a PTSD, for example, is, is a lack of that. It's, it's a situation in which the parts of the brain, and again, I'm gonna be incredibly simplistic because um, I don't know how to talk about the brain without being simplistic. Mm -hmm. But, but the parts, some of the parts of the brain, the major ones that mediate fear and anger and arousal, they get thrown off their set point. They got thrown off homeostasis and they can't get back. So you end up with an amygdala, for example, that mm -hmm. is super quick because of the hippocampus and the amygdala work together. And it's, it's all super quick to be reactive. So you get these people, for example, with PTSD who are who are hyper reactive, who are jumpy, who if they hear a loud noise, you know, they startle and they jump. Um, and, and all of that applies to dogs, you know, all of that, you know, the, the basic mammalian physiology and, and system of um, sort of the whole, the whole stress cascade is very similar among all mammals. And dogs can also get thrown out of homeostasis say it's at a dog park and it gets attacked from behind, didn't see it coming. And it's been this great dog with other dogs, love the dog park. And then the next day it goes back and it's fine. But the next time you go back, it's maybe a little grumpy and growly. And then two weeks later, it's attacking other dogs. I've had client mm -hmm. after client after client describe that. And that's just sort of classic, um, sort of classic PTSD actually, because it often builds over time. Mm -hmm. So dogs who are resilient can shake things off. They shake off the thunderstorm. They shake off getting scared by another dog. They shake off that rude um, guest who is, you know, hugs them in a way that they that terrifies them, right? Mm -hmm. That's what resilient dogs are. And dogs who aren't resilient can't get themselves back into that sort of normal homeostasis state they're stuck in being hyper reactive hyper responsive to sort of always on alert mm -hmm. and when you say it builds over time is that just an example of a dog becoming sensitized to the conditions in the environment right boy that's a good question um there uh, I, I am not i am not a neurologist i am not a specialist in brain function so, um, so i speak simplistically not just because it's helpful but because I know this much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know way more than I do. So I know, I know this much. <laughs> I know enough to get myself in a lot of trouble, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But so, but what, um, what seems to, what I understand anyway, is what mm -hmm. seems to happen with PTSD, for example. And I, I, I'm one of the people who believe that dogs can suffer from this. Um, mm -hmm. um, is it's, it's basically what happens is the brain starts changing. So there's this traumatic event. There's mm -hmm. a super traumatic event and it throws everything off of homeostasis. So the animal is scared and stressed. Um, there are all these hormones sort of working to keep that, to keep that going. That, that whole system, um, that whole nervous and hormonal physiological system ends up sort of working with the hippocampus, which stores a lot of memories, especially mm -hmm. fearful ones. And it starts building up, it's almost like a vaccine. It's almost like a vaccine in the wrong way. It starts building up and sort of creating over time this more and more extreme reaction. So it's very, so I, I that's, I'm just, it's very, that's very, very general and somewhat speculative, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely consistent that individuals who were traumatized, who have trouble getting over it can often seem fine, right? 
afterwards mm -hmm. and then it gets worse and worse and worse you know that that happened to me with some of the traumas that happened to me I was not really that bad for a while and then all of a sudden I couldn't sleep and was having you know nightmares and so so yeah that, and that that really uh, that makes sense given when we're interviewing our clients and you're really having to dig and they're like, yeah, there was really no traumatic event. And then you actually ask more and more questions and then you pinpoint something that may have not been so dramatic according to them, right. but it, it was, um, an attack at the dog park or it was, you know, um, somebody visited the house and hugged the dog in the wrong way or something like that. Right. So it, it does match that often clients it just takes them a little bit and a little bit of prompting and coaching to ask the right questions to get that information. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's a great reminder of how important a really good, relaxed, extensive interview is, you mm -hmm. know, to really have the time to talk it through. Cause you learn so much, don't you, by doing that, you know, and so I much. think it's partly, partly, um, you know, what you're suggesting happens because, because the event one event happens two weeks after the other event. So the dog is like, well, he growled at a visitor and nothing happened that night. You know, nothing mm -hmm. happened the next day, but it turns out two weeks before the guy who delivered pizza kicked him. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I love that you brought up relaxed interview process because I'm just, this is just a side note. I know all of the trainers that are listening feel this topic comes up a lot about feeling rushed, right. To, to mm -hmm. solve the behavior problems all like in that first initial consult, when, when oh, actually yeah. it's just, we've got to sit back and ask a lot of questions and really understand what we're dealing with before we dive right in with the protocol. So, yeah. um, I just want to hi highlight that because it's, it's such a, I hear it from so many trainers that there's this, there's this like feeling of pressure to just fix things. Right. So yeah. And could I just add to that? Because I yeah. thought that too. And I mean, I saw clients for 25 years or so, and I don't now I'm retired from that. Um, and I should just parenthetically say, I think we need to acknowledge what hard work it is. And I mm -hmm. truly, truly, and I really mean this from the bottom of my heart. I don't think anybody who does, who doesn't do it has a clue what difficult work this is. It's yeah. extremely challenging. It's extremely stressful you're dealing with two species mm -hmm. simultaneously, and you're usually dealing with two people who might not agree with each other, you know, or a whole family. <laughs> um, and, and so it's, this is hard stuff. It know? is hard stuff. And to help ameliorate that sort of pressure, one thing I did, I don't know if this is helpful, and maybe, maybe everybody else out there is just doing that now is, I think it's a lot about setting expectations and right. I would just be really clear up front and say like, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm doubtful. I'm going to, I'm not going to be able to fix it the first time I see you. Yeah. You know, what's best is for us to book three appointments. Right. And mm -hmm. then this will happen on the first one. I'll give you one. Usually I would give them one thing to do mm -hmm. one, one thing. No, well, usually two, one management, one training thing. Mm -hmm. And then we get back together anyway, so that I don't want to get too far off on that, but I just, I empathize with everybody. Yeah, else. no, I, I, I appreciate oh, that. And I think too, um, before I go into people's homes, I usually, I usually will stop and pause and say to myself, like, you don't have to fix everything today, Marissa. Yeah, and, then, and, and then I'll knock on the door because, for you. or I won't knock on the door. I will call them. And so that I'm not knocking on the door and setting off their dog. <laughs> so <laughs> just a side tangent, but, um. So I know that there is a lot that might affect a dog's ability to be resilient. So I just wanted you to share with our listeners today, just a few variables that are going to impact that. Yeah. And there are a lot. And I, most of the research that I know of comes from human research. We know a lot about resilience in people mm -hmm. and I've used that and I've projected certain amount of that onto dogs. And I think, I mean, that's projection, right? It's guessing, it's making those you know, hypotheses. But I think it's reasonable because, you know, as I said, that whole stress cascade, that mm -hmm. whole physiological waterfall between having something scare you, having that recorded in the brain, having that sent to different areas of the brain, and then having that sent to all the 
hormonal control centers and then being sent down to where you produce adrenaline of top of your kidneys. Um, it's the same in mammals. It's just the mm -hmm. same. Now, how we cognitively think about that, of course, is different. Of course it is. But um, one thing we know in people is that resilience is, is genetically mediated. There's a pretty strong genetic component. Mm -hmm. And and that should be obvious, really, in the world of dogs, just by looking at guide dogs for the blind, right? Yep. Who've been who've been breeding dogs for resilience and emotional stability um, so well and so long that when I years ago, I went over to a friend's house who was fostering mm -hmm. uh, a guide dog for the blind puppy, and I literally thought it was sick. I, I was there for an hour and I wow. said, I don't know if your puppy's okay. Mm -hmm. Cause it's not acting like a normal puppy. <laughs> yeah. It's just lying there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's lying there. Um, but it, it, I mean, they have been selectively bred to be calm and quiet and stable un relatively unreactive and um, but still smart. Right. Mm -hmm. And interested in working and attached to people and sort of all those other things. But most importantly, I would argue resilient, mm -hmm. resilient, because you can't have a dog freak out when they're leading somebody who is, in, whose eyesight is impaired, right? Mm -hmm. In some kind mm -hmm. of potentially dangerous situation. So one is genetics. And I think, you know, that's highly relative. If you're getting a dog from a breeder, it's obviously completely irrelevant. If you've adopted a dog, fostered a dog, found a dog on a street, right? Dog you don't know the background of. Um, mm -hmm. or, you know, and including, I'm both of my dogs, I, I did not rescue them, I purchased them, but they were older. You know, Maggie was 14 months, Skip was three. Mm -hmm. so, so not only did I have no control over their genetics, obviously, but also their early development. And that's another really important part of resilience is what happens during early development. And we now know that early development starts in utero. And so, I mean, there's several sources. I think your trainers probably know all about them. One of my favorites is the puppy culture mm -hmm. talks about developing resilience and emotional stability um, uh, in, in puppies, basically mm -hmm. as soon as they're born, going through those early developmental stages. And what we know from that is that uh, probably the most important point is that a certain amount of stress, not too much, you know, Goldilocks amount of stress, not too little, not too much, is really important to help an animal be able to cope with stress later on. If they're never, ever stressed um, during their early weeks of development, they have a harder time as adults dealing with kind of stress. So, so that early stress is important, but it needs to be accompanied by what's called a secure attachment base. It need to be, needs to be accompanied by something the puppy or the human child can go to where it's like, I, this, this is where I'm safe. I can run to this person, mm -hmm. this dog, this thing, and be safe. And so the right amount of stress along with a secure attachment base is really important in early development. So that's a second factor. And then obviously, you know, then we have now, you know, <laughs> then we have life, right? Yep. Um, and that can occur at any time. So what happens, you know, you, you can't sort out genetics and early development from how an animal responds to a particular trauma. You just, you know, by, by that point, all of those things, current experience and those two past factors are so intertwined with each other, you sort of can't tease them out. Mm -hmm. But if you have the right, um, or some would say that the, the problematic genetic component and early development, you can have a dog who is absolutely fine, appears emotionally completely stable until something happens, right? It's, it, it gets sent to a new home and it's in the shelter and it develops separation anxiety after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, it's fine. It loves everybody. And then it's in a dog fight at the dog park and it doesn't get hurt, but it's terrified and it can't recover from that. So usually, you know, there's an incident that sets it off, but again, whether it's turns into a lack of resilience or just another example of, yeah, well, that happened. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to depend on those two other factors. Yeah. And so then to circle back what you said in the beginning, it is really important for if something challenging happens to your dog that you're not only 
taking note of that initial moment, but you are following the dog and tracking the dog for a period of time, maybe several weeks or so to make sure that we're not seeing fluctuation in behavior. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we can determine whether or not that resilience is, is true resilience or not, or if the dog is um, going to react poorly to something, maybe the, the later on, down later the on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. And so when you're working with, or when you have worked in the past, or even with your own dogs, what are some of your favorite strategies to build confidence and resilience? I mean, there's so many games and so many protocols out there. And like, fortunately we have so many great leaders in our field talking about offering dogs choice and control over their environments and things of that nature. But what are your favorite? Well, just picking up on that, I mean, that, that whole perspective of giving dog agency and autonomy is just, oh, it's just so wonderful. It's just, mm-hmm. what a different world than when I started. You know? mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. I started with, you know, the world was, I was surrounded by prong collars and, you know, the nice version was a training collar that you snapped the dog with as hard as you could, if it didn't sit when you sat. So dogs had no agency. Um, and so, so one, that's huge. And, and part of why that's huge is because individuals who aren't resilient, they're, they're basically usually living in fear of what's about to happen. You know, I mean, that's what happens when you get traumatized and you can't quite get over it. What happens is you're always on alert. You know, you're always, um, your amygdala is always sort of fully wired and mm-hmm. buzzing. And you and you you're sort of always waiting for the shoe to drop. You're always waiting for something to happen, um, and so that creates a feeling of feeling out of control, right? Because mm-hmm. you never know what's going to happen, and it's going to mm-hmm. happen like that. It's going to happen just in a microsecond. So, giving dogs, giving individual dogs, a sense of control is. It's just huge. And that doesn't mean that they control you. you know? It yeah. doesn't mean, yeah. right, that that um, they become sort of whiny, pushy, needy, mm-hmm. lumpy things. And, and I say that very, very intentionally because dogs also, I mean, they can get really panicky. I used to work with troubled teenagers. And one of the things that teenagers are struggling with is autonomy, but at the same time, they need boundaries. They need boundaries. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, you know, if, if we fall into um, taking care of our dogs such that they always get everything they want, we'd like, oh, you know, she's whining, you know, oh, she wants to be petted again, even though I've been petting her for 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can end up with a dog who feels less secure. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so there's a balance there, but I mean, it's it's a very unbalanced balance because most of the time, anytime you can give them agency autonomy, like which way do you want to go to? We're walking on a leash, but which way do you want to turn? I'll go that way. You want to stop and sniff? We can stop and sniff here. That's fine. You know, that's how I do my dog's nails is like, is I'll, you know, if you're going to pull your paw away, I'll stop for a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, you give me your paw back, then I'll do a second, then you get a treat, you know, then your mm-hmm. choice. That's good. So autonomy or, and choice is really, really important. And I love that people are talking about that so much. I think that's huge. But at the same time, again, they need, I think, because of this fear of sort of the world being out of control, structure and predictability is mm-hmm. really, really important. And if you look at the human literature, predictability for young kids who've been traumatized in some way It's huge. It's really, really important. And it can take a long time for an individual who hasn't had it or fears that they've lost it to feel like things are predictable. You know, Mm -hmm. things are in control and things are predictable. I think the hardest thing for people related to that, it's not schedules. It's the fact that we are so inconsistent as humans. We are verbally inconsistent. We are behaviorally inconsistent. It's very hard for us to be consistent. And that's part of why we're so amazing as a species and and why we're talking on this ridiculous technology that we created (laughs) because we are, our our behavior is so flexible, Mm -hmm. right? It's amazing. But it also means that we can, we can get after a dog for getting on the couch at one moment and not the other. And right. And it also means that we can call common seven different ways, two of which 
two of which are intimidating, scare the dog. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's really important. Um, And then one of the things I do, and Marissa, I'm curious, I'll bet you do this too. I love to teach dogs who are suffering from a lack of resilience. Um, I love to teach them tricks, especially tricks that relax their body. My favorite is a play bow. It's my, I like everybody in the, that it should be in every dog training class. Mm-hmm. Beginning family dog training should have a play bow in it because if you can get a dog to play bow on cue, you can get it to relax mm-hmm. because it's a relaxing gesture. And it also, you know, it's mentally relaxing. You want to play, it's physically relaxing. It relaxes dogs around the dog. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know, do you use that? I love to teach tricks to dogs who are problematic. Yeah. I mean, I think it's fun for the pet parent, right. To engage in something like that and to see their dog be successful. But I used to use play bows, um, with my own dog when he used to be reactive to the sight of other dogs. Um, I would do a lot of like spin bow, um, and especially bow so that he, he, he has a tendency to be really forward. His tail curls up super high. So a lot of dogs are very intimidated just when he sort of walks into the space. Yeah. And so I did you, I did used to cue play bows for him. I mean, it's, as I said, he's 13, he's a little bit stiff right now. So I wouldn't do that right now. Yeah. However, um, yes, I did use that for him. And I, and I thought it was, it, it shifted his um, physical body, right. Which is going to shift his internal state, but it, it definitely was helping. I thought like the other dogs, cause again, he can yeah. be a little, right. a little bit tough. Like when, when he walks into a room, so Mr. Sully, yeah, oh, he's very, like, you're like, Whoa. <laughs> yeah. And I think Take your, a step point, back. <laughs> your point was so good about it's fun for pet parents. And I think it's, it's, um, it's fun for so many reasons. And I think mm-hmm. part of it is that whether we like it or not, a lot of the quote, and I'm quoting with my fingers, right? Mm-hmm. Traditional obedience, sit, lie down, stay. They get loaded somehow. They get, yeah. so, you know, we, very we, good yeah, they're like, this is, you know, this is about me. This is about whether you're listening to me. Mm-hmm. This is about whether I'm a good trainer or not. And I have a good dog. And, Mm -hmm. you know, this is about control and, and, you know, humans suffer from feeling lack of control too. Right. And Uh sometimes our dogs suffer for that. So when you give, um, when you give people things that are sort of silly and fun to do with their dog, it also, it lifts a burden off of them. You know, this is the game you're going to play with your dog. And if he does it fine, if he doesn't, yeah, big deal. What does that mean? He didn't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. There's low stakes. There's no stakes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so I think that's really important. And the, the, the last thing I want to mention, although um, we could talk about how to help dogs develop or get back to being resilient um, is the whole physiological aspect of it. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, basically I think it's critically important, but that's not my expertise. That's where I refer out, you know, that's why I have um, some wonderful veterinarians who do acupuncture, who do, who do holistic medicine, um, you know, who I, you know, I give my dogs, I think very carefully about what kind of food they eat. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, a lot of us focus, and I know, I mean, people can get just obsessed, the whole, what do you feed your dog thing is like, you know, if you want, oh my gosh, yes, right. (laughs) It's a loaded question. Ask what you feed your dog and then, you know, and then answer somebody's question about what you feed your dog and discover how you're the worst person in the world, right? (laughs) (laughs) Because you feed your dog that. But, um, um, oh, where was my head going? I just lost my train of thought. It was about, oh, I know. It was about, we think about nutrition and feeding. Mm -hmm. We often don't think about behavior in relation to what a dog ate. So, and I think there are a lot of correlations. And first of all, just to make an analogy, and this is, I mean, this is just hypothetical, right? But I don't know about anybody listening, but some people are far more, what, um, reactive to what they ate than others, right? I'm, <laughs> Marissa I'm, has her hands up. <laughs> yeah, very, yeah, I struggle. I have yeah, struggled for a long time, so- yes. Mm -hmm. You know, my husband knows is that you don't, you don't give Trisha bacon and pancakes and syrup Mm -hmm. before she's eaten an egg. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if you just give her pure sugar 
and carbs without any protein and fat, you know, yeah. she'll not be able to talk straight in a couple mm-hmm. hours and she'll mm-hmm. be asleep, you know? <laughs> so, so I really, I just had so many clients and dogs of my own where, you know, even just switching the brand, you know, even the same protein source, but switch the yeah. brand or switch the protein source or this additive or that additive, I think it can make a big difference. So what, so again, the last thing we need to think about, whether it's through holistic medicine, acupuncture, what you feed your dog, the kind of exercises you do with your dog. Um, uh, I think trying to affect that internal physiology can help tremendously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so appreciate you bringing that up. There is um, a holistic veterinarian that I work with here in Boulder. And more recently I had three cases of dogs that were what we would label as anxious and it manifested in a variety of different ways. And, um, all of them didn't feel well, all of them were itchy. Um, one of them, she diagnosed with, um, irritable bowel and that he wasn't actually feeling well. And then when we made a lot of those changes, his behavior changed as well. Right. So, I mean, and I was raising my hand earlier. Yes. I have had a lot of sensitivities around foods and, um, that affects my mood and that affects my behavior a tremendous amount. So, um, you know, knowing that that is that, you know, that is a critical element in looking at our dog, like just from this holistic viewpoint is, is such a great reminder. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You bet. So on this podcast, I really like to shine the light on the human end of the leash, which is, I think, perfect. You're, you're, you are the, you are the original person that is talking about the human end of, of the leash. Um, and we know that living with dogs can be so amazing and equally as challenging. Cause like you said, I mean, they are mammals as well. So living with mammals in general is, is really challenging. Um, and I wanted to bring up this topic today in terms of, um, so a lot of my clients or a lot of the circles that I'm a part of, a lot of people are bringing up the, the most recent research that is suggesting that like, if I'm a stressed person, then my dog might become a stressed dog. Right. right? Um, right. and there's right. a variety of different research studies, um, to suggest this, and we will link to those in the show notes, but I did want to read an excerpt from one of them. And then we'll talk a little bit about, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but, um, in one of the papers that I found that was, that has links to a bunch of other papers, it's called the current perspectives on attachment and bonding in the dog human dyad. So I thought this was really fascinating and I'm going to share my personal perspective in relation to this, but so it says the current research suggests the big five personality dimension of neuroticism. And so the big five includes just for those that are listening, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and openness. So may provide some preliminary indication of the dogmanship of an individual dog owner. So high neuroticism scores in dog owners have been associated with poor canine performance and operational tasks, handlers use of excessive signaling during training and delayed responses to owner commands. These results suggested that high neuroticism in dog owners contributes to poor functionality or poor dyadic functionality, and that individuals with good dogmanship are likely to score low on this trait. I just want to give our listeners um, a little insight that I took the test actually prior to us hopping on this call and I scored very high in neuroticism. So (laughs) what does this say about me? But um, nevertheless, owners with high neuroticism have been observed to be more socially attractive to their dogs, which I thought was really fascinating and need to tease out what that actually means or looks like. Um, These dyads being rated more friendly than other dyads by experimental observers and having lower salivary cortisol concentrations in their dogs. So I'm bringing up this topic and I wanted to talk about some of this is because I think some of the folks that again, are in my circles are really concerned. I hear a lot of pet parents say, 
gosh, like I'm a really anxious person and uh, I I'm contributing to so many of my dog's behavior problems. If I only was just less anxious, or if I only was, I could fix myself, then my dog's behavior problems could be fixed. And like I mentioned, I scored really high. I have a dog that I would label pretty stinking resilient. Um, like I come home after a lot of my clients give him a big kiss on the nose, which he tolerates, right? <laughs> because he's resilient. <laughs> um, and thank him for his ability to show up in the world and be, be okay. And so, um, so I think I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm contrary to what this is saying, right? So I wanted to get your perspective because I think we have a lot, a lot of pet parents getting stuck in like this shame spiral about like, well, great. Genetically, I'm just a more anxious person and I'm just not the right fit for my dog. And I don't know what to do. So I'd love to hear your perspective on this so that we can ultimately help take pet parents out of that spiral and build some resilience for ourselves in order to support our dogs. Oh, I love, I just love that you're bringing this up. It's just, this is, um, it's such an important topic. And, you know, I, I actually, one of the, um, one of the articles that, that got a lot of attention mm -hmm. just recently was written by Dr. Hal Herzog, mm -hmm. who is a great guy, by the way, he's a colleague and a, and a friend. He wrote, um, some we love, some we hate, some we eat about our complicated and contradictory relationship with other animals. Mm -hmm. um, he's been studying human animal relationships forever. And so he wrote an article not too long ago in Psych Today that quoted many of those studies that talked about the big five, that talked about how the strongest correlation um, between big five traits and owners and dogs seems to be between um, neuroticism and owners and dogs with, with behavioral problems, especially mm -hmm. aggression, for example. And so he asked me before, before it was published, he interviewed me along with a lot of other people. And he said, you know, what do you think? Do anxious people make anxious dogs? And I said, you know, the first thing I want to say about that is I cannot tell you how many clients I had over 25 years who had three of the coolest, calmest, stablest dogs you've ever met. And then they got that dog. Mm -hmm. That's the way they were in my clinic. And they'd never dealt with a dog like this before. And they often felt so guilty because say their dog was dog, dog aggressive. This was the most common one or human stranger aggressive. So they'd say, I know it's me. I know I'm making it worse because when we walk down the street and I see another dog coming at us, I get nervous. Mm -hmm. Well, of course you do. Of course you do. Mm -hmm. That happened. Your dog was in a dog fight, you know, you're, you know, <laughs> so, um, so the last thing I wanted to do was also to send people down this spiral you talk about, because mm -hmm. I knew people would jump on it right away of feeling like, oh no, what am I doing? It's all my fault. So, so here are a couple of things I want to say is, first of all, I found it helpful that there's a lot of pushback, first of all, just on the term neuroticism, <laughs> people, <laughs> because it has such a negative connotation. Yeah, it does. I, when I, you know, when I grew up, neurotic meant worrying about things you had no reason to worry about. That's mm -hmm. what neurotic meant, is worrying about things that weren't worthy of being worried about, you know. Um, and so that's not what they mean. They mean they actually, a far better term that people are using more now is emotional stability. Um, and I, and I, I think that's way better. Does that mean you're a wreck? No, it doesn't. Because like, look at you. you know? <laughs> um, actually, if I've told people, I said, if you're not scared right now, given what's going on in the world, you're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So Right. So, so you can score high in this category and be an incredibly together skilled person. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's an important thing to know. But the other thing that I think is really important is, is there, there's, there basically, there are two forces I think going at this that I find really important. One is that, is it possible that anxious owners make anxious dogs? Well, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. You know, emotional contagion, emotional contagion is a phenomenon we've known about for decades in mammals. It happened, you go to a movie and it's more fun to watch a movie in a movie theater because you're surrounded by people who are laughing, right? Mm -hmm. It's what comedy clubs are all about. 
You couldn't have somebody do stand up in your living room when you, you and your husband are sitting on the couch. It just wouldn't, you know, it just wouldn't be that funny. You need to be in a comedy club and people are drinking and they're all laughing. Mm -hmm. It's the same with, right? It's the same with fear. Um, so it's very contagious, which makes it extremely powerful. And there's a lot of that being used in the world right now. Um, so yes, certainly there's a factor in which if you're really nervous, that can somehow be conveyed to your dog. Does that mean you've made your dog dog reactive? No, yeah. not necessarily mm -hmm. at all. First of all, going back to genetics, you need to be talking about a dog who's got, who scores high on that too. Mm -hmm. And Sully is obviously the opposite, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, so I think we have to be really careful. And I'm particularly, I find that study that you quoted. I mean, I've seen some of the other studies, but I've never seen that one the one about the dogsmanship, which sounds very European kind of mm -hmm. phrase. Maybe one of your listeners know who knows who talks about dogsmanship. I'm assuming that's training, you know, mm -hmm. ability as a trainer. Um, but the fact that, that people who scored lower on, we'll call it emotional stability, didn't do as well with some kind of operational task, training task. Mm -hmm. And yet there was more attraction between dogs with people who scored higher. And so here's one of my, that relates to one of my caveats about all this research. And I'll just preface it with a story, a personal quick story, which is that all of my life, I have been attracted to fearful animals. I always have. I love, I did great with the shy horses. You know, I had a friend who was great with super bold, bold pushy horses. I was great with shy horses. Mm -hmm. I like, you know, I'm attracted to animals like that. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think there's a, there's an advantage to that because I think it makes you more empathetic. You know, I, I mean, I might anyway, potentially. So I think there's a great advantage in sort of understanding being afraid of the world. Um, or, you know, how, what it feels like to be set off and to be able to sort of use that and shape that in a treatment plan and that sort of a form of understanding. So I think it's really important that, yes, we acknowledge that there is such a thing as emotional contagion, you know, and it's possible. I mean, I wrote in, I wrote in the education of Will that, that Willie, who came as a puppy as if he'd been in Afghanistan for three tours and mm -hmm. um, had PTSD as a result of it, um, he set off mine. So I yeah. actually got worse. And then I'm pretty sure I probably made him worse. And so we were in a vicious spiral, but I was able to get us out of it. And I think I was probably possibly way more empathetic to Willie than other people might've been. Did that make me a better yeah. trainer? No, not necessarily, but, um, you know, but we were able to get out of it. So there is a component of emotional contagion, but also it's really important to understand this is much more complicated, mm -hmm. much more complicated. You know, this is, this is the scientific flavor of the month. And this happens all the time. Be really careful. You get a scientific finding. It's like, oh, neurotic people are with neurotic dogs. Therefore, they're causing them to be neurotic. Well, that's, you know, these are just correlations. Yeah. These are just, these are not causations, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and underneath all those headlines, there's a lot of really complicated stuff going on. So I would, whenever you read things like that, I would take a breath, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. take a breath. It's like, and just, you know, just remind yourself that, that, you know, as Dr. Chris says, we're all doing the best we can and, with the skills mm -hmm. we have at the time we have them. Yeah. You know, it's just totally. really difficult to remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure so many of our listeners will be very happy to hear your perspective on this, because again, it has come up over and over and over again. And, um, I think people have a sigh of relief or they take, they're able to exhale when they're just like, Oh, wow. It isn't just, yeah. it, it, it might feel so simple just to blame yourself. Like, Oh, if it's me, then I can fix me. It's like, well, right. it might not be that simple. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and that's actually, that, that reminds me of something my therapist said when I was working through some of my trauma baggage mm -hmm. is she said, you know, I was into that. If only I, you know, blaming mm -hmm. myself, if only I, if only I had done this, if only I hadn't done that. And, and she said, that's, 
She said, I hear that from everybody sort of no matter what happens, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I, I heard mm-hmm. that from clients who've been to 12 different vets trying to save their dog from dying of cancer and nobody could save their dog. And they're still like, if only I'd fed, you know, if only I'd yeah. done something differently, mm-hmm. maybe she wouldn't have died. Um, and what, the, what this great therapist said was, it is easier to go to the if only world, yep. you know, than it is to accept that weird, but dandelions in the wind and shit happens. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love And that's that. really scary. <laughs> I to- it's that's totally really scary. scary. We are not in control. And hey, we're dog trainers. Are we into control or what? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's get serious here. Let's get serious. There are some of us, you know, it's like, it's partly about controlling the behavior of another individual. It's just, <laughs> we're all trying to find the most benevolent ways to do it, but let's get serious. Let's That's get serious. Yeah. Yep. But, but the fact is, again, we are, we are little leaves in the wind, you know, that's mm-hmm. it. And stuff happens. And it's, you know, an, another thing one therapist said once was, you know, it's not always about you. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. That's the- and that that is a helpful. great, it's a super <laughs> helpful statement too. But yeah, I mean, the, the aging comment about the dog dying of cancer, right. As, as the example, it's like, I mean, I used to say like, well, if my dog dies, cause I was in such denial, I'm like, Marissa dying is like, it's a part of the process. Like I, I couldn't believe how, how much my language was protecting me from experiencing something that will happen. And so right. Right. Um, yeah, it was, um, I've done a lot of work around him aging since then, but I, yeah, it is like 12 veterinarians in that example, right there, the dog had cancer, right? Like, and, right. Di- and dying's on the table for all of us. Right. That's, that's um, right. yeah, it's, it is hard to accept some of those things and you're right. We are just sort of floating in the wind. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of floating in the wind, um, uh, how are some, what are some <laughs> strategies or some, some ideas that you can think of to help our pet parents build some resilience, right? Out, outside of getting their own team of professional support, right? Like if they're feeling anxious or they're feeling, um, concerned, that is not the dog trainer or the behavior consultant's role to fix those, the, those pieces of their life. Right. So outside of, creating their own support team, what might a pet parent do in order to build some of their resilience in order to support their dog? Oh man, we could talk for hours. I think I would love to hear what you have. I would love to talk to you about this for hours, but I don't think we have that. So, so let me just throw a few things out there. Um, One is something that's helped me tremendously in all of my life, but um, especially with dog training. And this actually comes from meditation Mm -hmm. practice is to be curious is Mm -hmm. to do everything you can to drop being judgmental because we're in my experience. And it sounds like you have the same thing going on, Marissa, is that, you know, in the world that we're living in, people are dog owners are so hard on themselves. So hard. So, you know, and parents are the same way now. Mm -hmm. You know, my kid's not, you know, I'm, I'm not the perfect parent, you know, what can I do to be a better perfect parent? And, you know, I was raised in a world in which our job was to stay out of our parents' way pretty much, Mm -hmm. not get in trouble. They went out, you know, five nights a week and did something else. And I mean, they were good parents. Mm -hmm. They were good parents. They just, but they didn't, they didn't feel like their, this is, this is relative to dog to pet parents, they didn't feel like their value as a person was sort of based yeah. around, you know, how perfect, how happy their kids were at any given period of time. Yeah. And I think that, that we can fall into that in the, in the sort of progressive dog world. Yeah. So the, I guess the first thing I'd say, and this has helped me with my dogs tremendously with sheep herding, because, you know, you have to make split second decisions. Things can go pretty bad, really fast. Your dog's chasing sheep into a fence. That's not okay to anybody, right? Mm-hmm. Um, is to be curious, is to tr- work really hard. Is like, what, you know, what happened? What am I feeling? You know, what happened? What could I do to prevent that? Um, what, you know, might, might be an explanation for why he did that or why she did that? Just 
being curious takes so much of the pressure and stress away rather than how could I let that happen? And mm -hmm. what's wrong with me? And I never if only, if only, <laughs> I, right. If I was just a better trainer, you know, I would know what to do now. It's just be curious. Mm -hmm. And it's so, I just found it so kind to your dog, you know? So you say, lie down and you expect them to, and they don't. And, and you know, and you're just, you're in a bad mood. You're tired, right? Mm -hmm. you know? We've all been there. It's something, been there. Working, you know, and it's just so easy to be like, oh, you know, you jerk. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, but if you can just take a breath and just like, okay, what am I feeling? Right. Anyway, so that's one thing. Um, and the, the other thing is that take a big view as much as you can. You know, I loved the beginning, you were talking, Marissa, about, you know, what are the 13 things I love about, you know, list 13 things I love about my dog. Just taking a big view because we can get so narrowly focused. Yeah. It's part of our skill as a human, right? Mm -hmm. Is we can narrow our focus and get narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. And it's all about they're not doing the weave poles. You know, it's just... Mm -hmm. It's all about the weave poles, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you know, and just, so just put it, giving space around opening up, opening up our perceptions, opening up our reactions, just sort of put it, giving space around the big picture and just sort of yeah. looking at your dog in a big picture rather than there is this one problem. What do I do? Yeah. You know, I think that helps tremendously. But the, and the last thing I would say is, is self-care is so important. And I think now, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but you don't need to be to know how challenging the world is yeah. for just about everybody. No question, some more than others. Mm -hmm. But this is a very challenge. I mean, I'm 72 and I went through a lot of stuff. Um, some really dodgy, some really terrifying stuff. I went through some eras, the whole Vietnam era. That was really hard for people who were, you know, in their late teens and early twenties. Um, I've never, ever, ever lived through a time that's like this where there were, I mean, basically I told my friends, I said, the, you know, the horsemen have mounted up you know, and they're riding right at us. You know? So yeah. self-care I think is so important. I, Hard to take care of your dog if you're not taking care of yourself. And if that means putting your dog in a crate and going and reading yep. a novel, do it, you know, do it. do it. And, you know, maybe this is not the time to learn a training, new training technique. Maybe it's the time just like, you know, for the next month, I'm just going to take my dogs on long walks and that's all I'm going to do. You know, being able to step back and say like, I'm just going to take a little pause here. I'm going to take care of myself, you know, and know how to do that. A lot of this we were never taught how to take care of ourselves, really. Mm -hmm. I don't think most of us were. You know, what do you need? What makes you feel safe? What makes you feel loved? What makes you feel protected? Mm -hmm. You know, think, spend some time thinking about those things because you're trying to provide that for your dog, but, but try and provide it for yourself too. Yeah, I love those three. That was perfect. I think um, in terms of self-care, I think for me, a lot of times, like I can go for a run by myself. Right. Or I can do a yoga class or, you know, like the, the traditional things you see on the self-care list, right. but I have found that the most important self-care I can do is be curious about my thoughts, right? Because my thoughts are with me all day long. And if my thoughts are, if I'm spending the whole day telling myself that I'm not enough in whatever context, right. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. yoga class, like barely scratches the surface. Do you know what I'm saying? And I so do. I do. It, it is really important for us to be like, I love that you bring up curious and you also were sprinkling in there, like taking a breath, right. Um, mm. our, our most sometimes I'm utilizing it more, but sometimes our most underutilized resource that we have always. Right. Um, so thank you for sharing those. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much for this amazing conversation. I appreciate you for being here and for all of what you shared today. Thank you so much. Oh, it's really fun to be here. You're doing great work. Um, thanks oh, for thank everybody you. who's listening. And just, I just want to end by saying again, what you're doing is hard and what you're doing is really, really important. So remember that and take care of yourselves. Thank you. 
So where can listeners find you online? Because you have so many wonderful resources, an amazing active blog. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Marissa. Um, just go to my website, which is just my name. Go to patriciamcconnell.com. Perfect. I, you can go to my blog there. There's a learning center with tons of free videos and articles about stuff. Um, so yeah, that's the best way to start. Perfect. Well, thank you again. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye.